No. Sorry, guys. Impromptu. I know David Wood is live with vocab talking about UFOs, but uh, I think this is better. Pray that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us, purify us, wash us, that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, for your sake, for your glory, fill us with the Spirit. Crucify our flesh, save us from our flesh. And Lord Jesus, I beg you for your glory, honor, and praise. Anoint me by your spirit to recall the scriptures perfectly, not to forget any one of them, and interpret them perfectly by <clears throat> the power of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse us, Lord Jesus, in your holy blood. Purify us in your holy blood, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood, the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Anoint this session by your spirit. <clears throat> Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, Lord Jesus, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And Lord Jesus, heal my throat and the sound of my voice, Lord. And Lord, be with our loved ones. Be with my daughters. Wash them. Cleanse them in your holy blood, Lord Jesus, and flood them. Flood us in your infinite love <clears throat> and your living waters and destroy attacks of Satan. Save me from stammering and confusion and bless your people. For your glory in Jesus' name. We love you, Son of God. We worship you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in Jesus' name. <clears throat> All right, let's begin. This brother here has a Muslim friend who doesn't want to call, so we'll still answer his questions. Hold on, where's the Skype? Excuse me. Oops, okay. Hiccup. <laughs> Can you hear me, my friend? Hey, Sam, how are you doing? Good, brother. God bless you. So your friend you. <clears throat> doesn't want to join. That's fine. You can send them yeah. the link. Send them the link to listen. And let's deal with his most important objections first. Before I even <clears throat> begin answering some of these questions that he had, mm -hmm. folks, invite people to come and learn and benefit, trusting the Holy Spirit to guide this conversation for the glory of Jesus. Um, I would never... Let a Muslim get away with bringing up contradictions in the Bible without that Muslim first dealing with what Muhammad taught about the Bible. So I don't know why you're engaging him on supposed alleged Bible discrepancies, because just like Muslims and skeptics point out errors in the Bible, and Christians have been answering them for centuries, mm -hmm. even though some people may not like the answers, nonetheless, Christians have tried to provide answers. Christians and skeptics have been pointing to contradictions in the Quran for centuries, and I'm pretty certain he would run to a Muslim upside to answer them. So that doesn't really get us anywhere. <clears throat> the real question, and I don't know why you're not pressing him on this, obviously in a loving manner because you want to win him to Christ. What did Muhammad yeah. teach about the Bible? And if Muhammad taught the Bible is the incorruptible, preserved words of God, why are you attacking it? Don't you believe what Muhammad says? Now, if he says, well, I don't care what Muhammad says, good. Then I won't appeal to Muhammad anymore. Now we can deal with he says that He says the Torah is corrupted. He says the New Testament is corrupted. Where? We don't have it. Where? You know, the same usual objections. Where? And then where I bring up the verses say? from the from the Quran that says, you know. Yeah, where? Uh, what does the Quran say? Go to the people of the gospel. Brother, you're not listening. Try to listen, Sorry? brother. Try to listen, too, because you're talking okay. the time. Where does the Quran say? The original Torah is corrupted. Where does he? It doesn't. Okay, so he, he, he brings me to a verse yeah. where it says uh, the people they you know they they say this is from Allah for yeah, for a small two, profit, things like that. Yeah. So I would say, can you stop using this very pathetic argument that's been refuted over and over again that shows that the Quran is full of contradictions because it's chapter two, verse seventy nine. So when are you going to stop using these bad arguments and deal honestly with what the Quran says? So have you pressed them on it? Mm -hmm. Honestly, no. I've I've been light on them. I haven't even brought up the hadiths yet. You know, I have all. You know, I've read I've read a few of them. 
actually a lot just about Muhammad's character and he thinks he's like the greatest thing yeah. ever living, right? Yeah, you're being too nice, man. So you're being too nice I, because you I think am. I'll tell you why. Because you think mm -hmm. being very nice somehow is going to convince him. As you see, it's not working, is it? Mm -hmm. I yeah, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting that. I'm understanding that now. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to rock and roll, shake his foundation and say, Okay, now let's talk about the errors in the Quran and the immorality mm -hmm. of Muhammad. So what I want you to do is obviously you don't want to lose him, but at the same time, you don't want to <clears throat> tailor your message in such a way that you don't offend him because at the end of the day, I'd rather offend a Muslim, shake his foundation mm -hmm. to plant a seed that will never leave mm -hmm. him by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then he comes mm -hmm. to faith later, then try to tickle his ears and keep him confident in his false religion, his false prophet, his satanic book, and send him on his way to hell. Mm -hmm. Right? So now, with that said, we'll deal with his objections. It's not the issue of objections, but friend, you, yeah. every objection you answer, he's going to come back with more because he's already made up his mind. The Bible's not true. Islam is true. Exactly. So you got to destroy his confidence. you got to do what yeah. David Wood did. Exactly. He's he, says that, he says that the Quran is even 1% false, then he will leave the religion. And I brought, I've shown him the links about, you know, the 37, 26 different mm -hmm. Qurans, the, the J. Smith and uh, Al-Fadi sessions. And obviously... I mean, he said himself, too, that he kind of hates J. Smith, right? And he doesn't trust them or anything, so... Okay, so then... I don't know. Instead of like, sending I don't links, know how much evidence they need. What, instead of sending him links, why don't you then quote the sources? Say, okay, go to Bukhari and read it for me. Where is J. Smith lying? Why don't you then, instead of sending him a link, you take down the references and bring them up? I've asked, I've asked him, but then he just, uh, he points me to a free response. He says, oh, he's refuted everything okay, so about okay. him. Let's, let's talk about it. And, and let's all that. talk about but, it. Yeah. Let me repeat it again. He doesn't, he, he, does, he doesn't refute it himself. He, he just brings me to, he just points me to videos and, and, and I, and I, you know, I watch him just for this, just for the sake of his argument, but. Okay. So really let's talk about the me. answers. Okay, what in Farid's response refuted what Jay said? Okay, can you explain to me? Why you I didn't see anything. Uh, they're, they're, I, I guess, make, I don't know, making fun of the pronunciation and things like that, but it's kind of weak, right? They're not really addressing the, yeah. the matter. Well, brother, and I you're try not, to point you're not listening them, again, but they don't brother. see the bias. Brother, can you take a brother? Yeah. I want you to count five with me. One, All right. two, three, <laughs> four, five. You, you don't listen well. I've noticed that. You don't listen well. When you talk to him, do you do that, that you don't listen well? Because you haven't listened to anything I've said. So i got to now deal with you. Let me repeat again. I didn't say you go watch and refute. I said ask him. Mm -hmm. What about Farid's response shows that Jay Smith is wrong? Did you I've ever asked say? him. Yeah, of course you haven't. So... What's I going have, on, I brother? Have, I okay, we asked him. So, what did he say? What's his response? What did Freddie say that shows that Jay Smith is wrong? Can you help explain to me? Yeah, the one example I can remember um, is the uh, like the Malik and Malachi example, yeah. and I guess that's like a, a basic example of them saying how mean how the word does not change its meaning is just a yeah. different pronunciation. Which is the original word in the heavenly tablet? That is the original uncreated speech of Allah. I haven't asked them that See, yet. that's the thing. Now, Javalinia, hold on one second. Javalinia, instead of barking like a mad dog in the comment section, don't run. When I'm done with this, brother, you can call me Javalinia, and I will punish you and your prophet for the glory of Jesus. Now, let's go to the questions. I just want you to change the way you're dialoguing with this man. I want you mm -hmm. to change your strategy, change your approach. Because your approach is not working. Now you're going to have to hit him, you know, shock and rock. And you're going to have to learn how to ask questions because you're not asking the right questions. Okay. Okay, you're saying it's an insignificant difference. But it's still different, right? It's either owner or king, right? Yeah, so owner and king is not the same word, right? Which of the words are actually found in the heavenly tablet? Which of the words are the actual uncreated speech of Allah? Which one of the two? You're saying all of them? Okay, so that's how you have to ask. You have to learn how mm -hmm. to ask the right questions to get him to think more deeply instead of pat answers. So 
You're okay with differences in, in the Quranic readings. So then what's your problem with the differences in the Bible manuscripts? So why are you attacking the Bible for differences that don't change the meaning? You still get the same theology, same picture of Christ, same message of salvation, but still it's not good enough for you because the Bible has variants. Now that the Quran has thousands of variants, that still doesn't mean anything because we still know what the Quran says. So why are you changing? Why are you changing your argument? First, the Bible can't be reliable because it has thousands of readings. Even though none of those readings change the doctrine or the message of the Bible, you still get the same Jesus, the same God, same spirit, same message of salvation. But now that I showed you there are thousands of variants of the Quran, and a lot of these variants don't agree, oh, it doesn't matter because the meaning is the same. Wow. So you're not interested in the truth. So then you're going to have to then use discernment. You're going to have to use discernment. And realize when it's a, enough is enough. But let me answer some of the questions for your benefit. And Javelina, we have a customer, guys. After my brother and I'm done helping him, Javelina is going to defend her pedophile, woman whoring, woman raping prophet who raped women and prostituted them, calling them muta. So get ready, Javelina. Don't run. The black stone's not going to help you. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right. Okay, hold on. Richard Kaser, are you a Muslim? Richard Kaiser, are you a Muslim? Kaiser, brother, do you mind if I put you on hold and I school these little children? One second. Don't go anywhere. Because we have another, we got two Mohammedans. The demons are manifesting through them. Richard Kaiser, are you a Muslim? Because I'm going to have you call right now. No? What are you? Are you an anti Trinitarian? What are you? Because you mentioned Mark 12 29, because I'm going to use Mark 12 29 to expose it. If you're not a Trinitarian, you're worshiping Satan, thinking you're worshiping God. Sorry, you, brother. Hold on. We got a lot of customers today. Yeah. Just sorry about that. See, all the demons started manifesting. Richard Kaiser, what do you believe? Because you're going to have to call me now. Okay. Brother, do you mind just going to my YouTube channel? Listen. Let me send Javelin on her merry way, and I'll call you back. But don't go anywhere. All right. No problem. So, because, brother, we got two customers. You're a Trinitarian. Your friend's not going anywhere. Let me deal with these children. Okay, uh, Richard okay. Kaiser, call me. So, brother, I will call you right away. Go to my comment section. Richard Kaiser, can you call me first? Because Javelina is uh, is simply manifesting and foaming at the mouth like her prophet. She's not going to last too long. But, Kaiser, I want to school you on your false god. Because, Kaiser, you worship a false god. Your god is Satan that you think is the god of the Bible. And I want you to prove me wrong. Can you call me, Kaiser? Don't call me Kaiser. But just call me on Skype. Are you willing to do that? Or am I wasting my time? Kaiser, can you call me, or am I wasting my time with you? Kaiser, let me repeat again. Are you going to call me, or are you wasting my time and defend your false god that you think is the true god of the Bible when it actually is Satan? Kaiser, one more time before we block you. Will you call me? Will you call me? Okay, Javelina, uh, you little slut of the devil. Okay, Richard Kaiser, call me. Javelina, I know you're a spiritual whore of Satan. Don't leave anywhere. Stick around, because what you want to do to your prophet and to your achi. Achi. Call me, Richard Kaiser. Guys, muzzle her. Keep putting her on timeout until she calls me. Just muzzle that dog, that female dog of, of Allah and his messenger. You want to talk about disrespect? We'll talk about Muhammad, how he cursed people and raped them and murdered them. So don't talk about disrespect because your prophet, I'll embarrass him. He was an embarrassment to humanity. Okay, Richard Kaiser, I'm waiting for your call. Oh, my goodness. Download Skype. Now, Javelina, because you are a little spiritual whore of the devil, you call me. You better call me in less than a minute. Okay, is that that little uh, spiritual whore, Javelin? Is that you? So we can begin. You better not be shouting and foaming at the mouth like your prophet. Hopefully, you can answer questions. Let me do this. Oh, she deleted the account. Did she? What is this? Deleted account. <laughs> If she starts foaming at the mouth, I'll block you. Javelin, I hope that's you. Better be you. Hello? 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 Yes? 
Is this Javelina? It's, yeah, it's Javelina. Why are you using whatever. a woman's name, Javelina? It's Javeliana, but whatever we're going to talk about, yes. you know, your false accusations against my prophet. You sure you it's are, false? Go to chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 24. So let's deal with it. Okay, this. and let's go to the Bible because go I have to chapter four, verse inside 24. my book. Inside my you want book. me to hang up on your face and your prophet and spit on him? Go to chapter 4. <laughs> go to chapter go to 4, verse 24. Go to, go to chapter 4, verse 24. Go to Matthew 125. Go to chapter 4, verse 24. Of the Quran. No, go to 125. Don't go to Matthew 125 where Joseph did not know Why how to give birth. Why are you to go to Matthew 125? Do you want me to muzzle you and your prophet? You're, you're, are you ashamed of your prophet but because he was a whore? Anything. Go to 424 because I'm going to humiliate your prophet if you don't. Go to Surat al Nisa 24. Five, four, three. Why don't you want to go to Matthew 125? Shut up, you filthy dog. Stupid dog. Block this dog. Doesn't want to answer anything. Wants to deal with the accusations, my prophet doesn't want to defend Muhammad. You filthy dog. You, you make Muhammad look clean. Scum. Yeah. Send him out of here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, stupid. Oh, what a stupid, filthy dog. Guys, why are you letting Javelina lie about Joseph and Mary? Okay. This is scum love. Scum low life. Your prophet molested a 12 a nine-year-old when he was 54 and you're making up a story about joseph and mary so don't deal with these slime now kaiser are you next because i just interrupted this precious brother to muzzle you dogs of the devil for the glory of jesus christ kaiser are you next do you have skype downloaded or we're going to block you too kaiser are you next are you calling is richard kaiser there I had to hang up with this poor brother because I thought we had serious customers. Do not show any respect. Christians, show no respect to these filthy dogs of Allah and his messenger who insult the mother of our Lord Jesus and lie about Joseph, muzzle them, and shame Muhammad, who did rape women, who did rape women, and treated women like Javelina's mother as prostitutes. Here you go again. Let's see. Hello? Sam, yeah. Sam Shmo was. Who is this, bro? <laughs> I thought you were Javelina. Who is this? No, man. <laughs> Why are you laughing, man? Talk to me. What? I, I wanted to ask you a question, but I see you in a battle right now. So. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Well, what question? Who is it first before you get dialed to him? Who is it? It was, uh, it was uh, the question was about. Um, you want me to hang up on you? I'm going to try it again. Who are you? Oh, this this is um, uh, daily light. Remember? But then, why don't you tell me it's daily light, man? Why are you hesitating? I you saw my, name. my name is not showing on the. No, um, it's not, bro. Bro, your name ain't showing up, bro. Oh. It says oh, live C I D B nine seven six three four six four three B zero zero B C six five. That's daily light. What kind of name is this, man? Oh, uh, uh, I thought it was daily light. <laughs> you little sinner. Sorry. All right. You know what you did, right? Daily Life? You ended up interrupting me when I was answering this other brother because I hung up on him because I wanted to deal with these other Muhammadans. But go ahead, ask your question. And that brother with the Muslim questions, don't go. I'm going to call you back because these Muslims and these children of the devil, anti-Trinitarian heretics, don't got the courage to defend their false gods. But go ahead, bro. What's your question? What happened? Man? We hung up? Yeah, what's your question? Go ahead. Yeah, um... The question was about this. I was talking to uh, one, of, one of the Muslims, uh, and they said um, they usually use this when you talk about Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old. Oh, they usually use this. Um, they say, well, in the Catholic Church, they teach that uh, Mary was 12. Brother, why are you repeating the same so they question use that, that this other guy repeated? Why are you repeating the same question? I mean, that's what he said. Okay. Oh, How many times do I have to answer that question daily? I hear Islam critique, myself, and David would answer that question. Now, to answer Catch-22, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36 answers your question. Post it for Catch-22. Okay, so Mary being 12 proves what exactly? What does that prove exactly? Uh, that it's okay for a 54-year-old man? To sleep and have sex with a nine-year-old premature ma uh, minor that's playing with dolls? Is that what it's supposed to prove? 
What does it prove According exactly? According to them. Huh? According to them. Okay, so they're saying because someone who is past the age of puberty and mature enough emotionally and physically to know about sexual intercourse justifies a 54-year-old man having sex. Brother, I think I got to hang up on you because your connection is terrible. Are you listening? Yeah, I've seen okay. you for a little bit. Yeah, well, if you're going to keep doing I'm going to have to then just hang up on you because your connection is bad. So a woman who is past puberty, mentally, emotionally, and physically mature to know about sexual intercourse justifies a 54-year-old man sleeping with a nine-year-old premature minor playing with dolls who would even know that she was being given to a 54-year-old man who's old enough to be her great-grandfather so he can take her to bed and penetrate her and defile her. It's disgusting. Yeah, exactly. Why can't you then respond that way and tell them? And not only that. Because I don't have and, mind, Sam Shimon. No, you, listen, you don't need to have my mind. I hope you have a better mind because I am sinful, imperfect, corrupt, tainted, need the blood of Jesus Christ to wash me sincerely and transform me by the power of the Holy Spirit. But coming back to the issue, okay. Let me prove to you that Mary was beyond, in other words, she had gone past puberty. She was emotionally, mentally, physically mature enough to be married. Can I prove that to you from Scripture? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's go to Luke 1. Luke 1. We're going to read 28 to 35. Okay. And I want the Christians to learn how to respond because it kills me when Muslims bring this up and we Christians don't know how to answer them on the spot and silence them and expose their filthy pedophile prophet. Now, do you have your Bible with you, brother? Uh, Can you get it? Yes. Okay, open it up because I'm going to have you read for us, okay? It oh, kills gosh. me. I mean, come on, Christians. We can <laughs> destroy this argument. Okay, Luke 1. What do you want me to know? I want you to read 28 to 30. Just 28 to 30 first. What, what, uh, what book? Which part of Luke wasn't clear? The Luke or one? Oh, uh, Luke. You're killing me, brother. Jayla, you know, you know, you're not too light tonight. It's very heavy light. Good, good. Read Luke 1, 28 to 30 for me. Uh, I'll put you on speaker. Yeah, go ahead. Put on speaker. Make sure your connection's good, and then read the Bible. Let me see. Yeah. yeah. I don't put this on speaker. It's on speaker. We can hear you, brother. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, we're waiting, brother, before the rapture. I'm going to leave you behind. Right. You got less than a minute, bro. Say Luke chapter what? Yeah, Luke chapter 1, verse 28 to 30. Brother, if I have to repeat it the third time, brother, we're going to have to end this call because you're not following with me because we're wasting time. You, you, I hope you understand, right? Are you going to be listening? I'm at Luke chapter 1. Okay, let's read 28 to 35. Now, just read 28 to 30. Catch 22. It's there, but you're blind like your filthy prophet, the son of Satan. Catch 22. We're going to get there. I'm going to show you how 1 Corinthians 7, 36 assumes a woman has to have gone beyond the age of puberty and fully right, unlike Aisha, who is a child with dolls, you filthy, sicko son of Satan. Now, go ahead. Richard Kaiser, call me on Skype or I'm going to muzzle you. Call me on Skype. Don't hide in the comment section. I'm going to show you Osiris and Hor Horus is your father, the devil. Now read Luke 1, 28 to 30. All right. It says, uh, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, though that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Okay, now, what I want you to read slowly, 31 to 33. What does he say to her? Now that you found favor with God, Mary, go ahead. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Mm -hmm. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Okay, now, guys, here's where I need you to pay attention. You can muzzle Catch-22, the filthy dog who makes Muhammad look clean, even though Muhammad was a filth scum himself. Just put him on timeout until I get to him. Guys, pay attention to Mary's response. 
the angel Gabriel, don't let Satan distract you, rebuke Satan in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be covered by the blood of Jesus, washed in the blood of Jesus, filled with the spirit of God for the glory of Jesus. Pay attention now. Pay attention. Okay. After Mary tell after Mary's told she's going to conceive and give birth to a son. Notice her response, 34. All right, 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not men. So does that sound like a young girl who doesn't know that children are produced through sexual intercourse? She sounds very, um, she sounds like an intelligent woman, actually. So if she is a premature minor, how does she know that the only way she can have a son is through sexual intercourse? And since I'm a virgin and I'm not married and I don't have a husband, how can I get pregnant? Does that sound like a woman who's mature enough so that she's not a premature minor playing with dolls and on swings? <laughs> What's the answer? Because your phone's on uh, haywire. Oh, yeah. You want me to keep reading? No, I want you to answer. Well, what you said is very, it makes a lot of sense because is, is she speaking to the angel almost like she knew the, um, the way how, uh, how to like, conceive a child? Almost like? No, well, yeah, like, like she does know. I mean, I shouldn't say like. She does know. Um, um, the way how to conceive a child yes. and even I'm reading the verse as you're talking and even went further when Mary even seemed even more like she knows what she's talking about no um, don't say more through. like she does know see the like part is where you're confusing me she does know what more like what there's no like she knows she does know she said it she said how can right. I be pregnant so what do you mean it's like she knows she does know yeah yeah, yeah. I'm just adding, I don't know why I'm adding but and then yeah, he she, says, she does know when um, and then he explains that your birth, you're, you're going to conceive miraculously without sexual intercourse so that your child, the holy thing, will be called the Son of God. But then to show you how mature she is, I want you to read Luke 1.39, Luke 1.39, all the way to 40. All right. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and right? saluted Isabel. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, right? Because yeah. you said Isabel. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, right? Okay, so here's my question for you. Does it sound like a nine-year-old premature minor who doesn't know her way around places because she has to travel a distance to her relative's house? No, not at all, actually. Okay, okay now, to show you how mature she is, can you read Luke 1, 46 to 52? Luke 1, 46 to 52. Uh, okay. Uh, and Mary said, My soul doth, does magnify the Lord, and my spirit had rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he had regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. Does this, sound like, a, does this sound like a nine-year-old premature minor who doesn't know the scriptures, who doesn't know who God is, and doesn't know the honor that God has bestowed on her. Because when you keep reading all the way to 52, she's going to refer to what God does for his servants. How he exalts the humble and humbles the wise and the arrogant, those who think they're mighty. Clear allusions to the Old Testament. So that tells you that Mary is saturated in the Old Testament, knows the Old Testament, and even alludes to, her, to it in her praise of God for what he's done for her. Does that sound like a nine-year-old premature minor Playing with dolls and on swings. No. Matter of fact, uh, just to even make it even better, I think Mary Mary seems very mature, and she seems even more mature than a lot of the, the older females today. Okay, so the point is, don't let Muslims who are filthy dirt bags dogs, because you got to be a lowlife, you got to be a filthy dog, you got to be scum of the devil, to justify what a 54-year-old pervert did by taking a nine-year-old minor, premature minor, who had reached puberty, playing with dolls and on swings, and defile her in the bed, and then leave her a widow without children at the age of 18. You got to be from the pit of hell. You got to be so demonized, so sick, so filled with the devil to even try to justify it, and then de 
demote Mary, dishonor Mary, by trying to show that Mary's conception of Jesus by the Spirit is similar. Yep, that's that's honestly true. And just just to um defend you a little bit, Sam, because I haven't watched for a while and I just came back and I see you go go uh, battling out um um uh, the Muhammadians, what do you right. want to call them? Muhammadans. Um, just to defend you a little bit, a lot of Christians are saying that the way Sam is talking is bad, but I, I just want you guys to know that this is what Christianity needs right now, exactly. because I think Christianity have turned into this um, liberal, you know, liberal, let's kiss the feet of everyone, and and it's just foolishness. I'm even seeing in, in uh, churches nowadays of, 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 of pastors kissing the feet of, of evil people. So That's right. That's what, so you hope you got your answer on that one. Don't ever let them use that again. Mary was a mature young woman. Obviously, she's not 30s and 40s, but she's mature enough to know about sexual intercourse, how children are conceived, mature enough to know about the Old Testament and the promises of the Old Testament and recite them in her praise of God and mature enough to know where her cousin Elizabeth lives and how to get to her house. I heard the argument before, which I wanted, which is what I actually wanted to use. Yes. Um, the argument that actually Mary was actually 20 years old. Yeah. No, I, you don't need to use 20 or even if she's 14 or 15, because typically they get married at 14, 15 to other 14, 15 or 16 year olds. All you need to show who don't give an age because the Bible doesn't give an age. What the Bible does show you is that Mary was a mature young woman who knew the God of Israel, knew about the Old Testament and the promises of the Old Testament, knew how to praise the God of Israel and Israel, the language of the Old Testament, knew about how children are conceived through sex, and she knew enough to know how to get to her cousin's house. That's all you need to know. Don't add too much to it, all right? And to the temple, <laughs> I mean, it goes even deeper, actually. Yeah. That's nine um, months later, yes. Yeah. But you keep keep the, just keep that in mind. That's all you need to do. You don't need to give an age. All you need to show is that she wasn't Aisha, a premature minor, playing with dolls and on swings and having a 54-year-old man old enough to be her great-grandfather, defiling her, destroying her physiologically and psychologically, and then leaving her as a widow at 18, never to get married and have children again. This man was cancer. He was filthy scum of the pit of hell. May the Lord Jesus erase Muhammad from the minds of everyone on the earth. So I hope that answered your question. I mean, you did an ex excellent job, actually. That just clears up everything, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to go back to this Muslim and see what yeah. he says. But remember, <laughs> focus on understanding the text because you don't need uh, Einstein to see it. It's just asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate you to read carefully because it's all there. It's right there. Just read with understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that helped you, brother. Yeah, that, that, that helped me a lot. Um, I mean, I don't want to keep you time. Okay, brother, because all we right. got some other people. I know it's all about you. It's your world. We're a squirrel. We're just doing a chat. <laughs> right. You can come right after this, brother, because I got to go back to this, brother. All right? I love you, man, but not too much. All right, all right peace. God bless. God bless you. Okay, now for Catch-22, post First Corinthians seven thirty six, And, brother, I'm going to call you back. Catch-22, I'm going to call. I'm going to now confront you with these passages. And you better answer them, and then I'm going to have a question for you. I'm going to send you to Mecca to lick the black stone like the pagan that you are. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7, 36. Guys, pay attention here. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Now, for anyone... That's not illiterate like Muhammad and smooches a black stone and gets brain damage from smooching the black stone. Do you see that Paul is assuming that virgins who are, who are married off are only married off when they have gone past the age of the flower of their youth? Do you see that? Do you see that? Does going past the flower of their youth fit Aisha's description? Was Aisha past the flower of her youth? Or is Aisha a young girl, premature, physiologically, psychologically premature, playing with dolls and on swings? 
Now, let me give you another one. For those of you who ask you for the age of marriage, okay? Let me give you another one. Are you ready? It's okay, Protestant. We're muzzling this dog and shaming his prophet, the son of Satan, and burying him in hell. Okay, now, let me show you another passage, Ezekiel 16, 6 to 8. And then we're going to ask Catch-22 a question. Catch-22, I want you to quote for me the Quran where it says, A woman in Islam is only to be married when she has gone past the flower of her youth, when she is post-pubescent. Post-pubescent. Thank you, Fortitude. Okay, Ezekiel 16, 6 to 8. Read with me, guys. Ezekiel 16, verses 6 to 8. I don't know if First Class got a Joe Biden moment. He did post it. Sorry, brother, because there's so much texting going on. I'm sorry. It's Protestant will always be the original Joe Biden. Ezekiel 16, verses 6 to 8. Guys, focus. Ask the Lord Jesus to help you focus. Don't be distracted. Rebuke Satan. Ask the Lord Jesus to wash us in his blood and fill me with the Spirit. Ortho Christos, everyone, read this parable for me because God likens his relationship to Israel as a man who's betrothed to a woman and marries her. Guys, no, notice here. Notice, guys. Don't let him distract you because he's, he's just manifesting and foaming like a dog like his prophet used to. Ezekiel 16, verses 6 to 8. Watch here. Okay. Watch here. Read with me. And when I passed by thee, he's talking to Israel, describing Israel as a young girl, and saw thee polluted in thy own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Now watch. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the flea, the field, bud of the field. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue and save me from error. Thou hast increased and waxen great, Thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned. Thine hair is grown. Pay attention to seven. Thy hair is grown, whereas thou was naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. Oh, now it's time for you to make love and get married. And I spread my spirit over thee and covered thee. Now, let's go to the New King James Version because the King James was kind of hard to understand. Ezekiel 16, verses 6 to 8. Ezekiel 16, verses 6 to 8. Okay? And when I pass by you, guys, please read this with me because this answers a question. Okay? And saw you struggling in your own blood. I said to you in your blood, live. Because God is describing Israel as a baby abandoned to die. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. Now watch. Verses 7 to 8. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed. Your hair grew. It's not about guys, pubic hair here. But you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, now notice verse, verse 8. Indeed, your time was a time of love, so I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore no to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord Jehovah. Did you catch it? Here God is using parabolic language to describe Israel as an abandoned female girl, a baby girl left to die. He caused her to live and waited for her to become developed physiologically and mentally, when it was time for her to get married, he married her. Notice when the time was after her breasts were formed and she had pubes, hairs. These were the time signs. She's now gone past puberty. It's time for lovemaking. Now I marry you. Was Aisha's breasts fully developed and formed? Did she have hair at nine? Or was she a premature minor playing with dolls and swings and a grown man, a 54-year-old sexual deviant pervert, son of Satan, married her and defiled her and destroyed her? Right? You see? That's what it is. So hope that that benefited you guys. Did that benefit you guys? Because I'm answering for you guys, not for these dogs who are barking at their master, the Lord Jesus, 
as the Lord Jesus enables us to destroy Muhammad. Right? Okay. Where is Kaiser who was barking? Where's Kaiser? So he can call me. If not, I'll call the brother, answer his questions. Everyone clear? Okay. Yeah, but what? how sickening. Now, Christians, this is why you should be irate. You should be livid and angry with holy indignation that these filthy demons would dishonor the mother of our Lord, demean the mother of our Lord by trying to compare her conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit to a grown man, 54-year-old man, plowing into and defiling a nine-year-old premature minor. It should disgust you with these pigs. These filthy pigs that would do that and dishonor the mother of the Lord. That again proves the point. What does it prove? They do not love the true Jesus. They do not love the true God. They do not honor the true Mary. They don't have the true spirit and they don't honor the true word of God. They have a satanic counterfeit, a satanic Isa, a satanic Mary, a satanic God, a satanic gospel, and a son of Satan named Muhammad. Do you see how they manifest when you speak of the true God, the true Christ, the true spirit, the true mother of our Lord, blessed and pure, and preach the true gospel and proclaim the true word? You see how they manifest? You see their hatred and their venom and their blasphemy? They start foaming like wicked, filthy, demonic dogs? Don't let them lie to you. They don't respect your Jesus. They love Asa, the satanic counterfeit, Created by Muhammad, the son of Satan. Okay? You with me there? So now, guys, mods, control the comment section. If demons start manifesting, muzzle them and throw them out because now I want to answer. And if Richard Kaiser doesn't call, block him, that little coward, because he knows his God is fake. He can't defend his God. So let me call this brother now. Poor brother. Okay, brother. Hello. Now you uh, you got me. Kaiser, are you calling me or no? See, sorry. See, look at the demon manifested. Right when I call you, this wicked son of Satan manifested. Oh, you are a coward. He says he's a coward. Block him, them. Get him out of here. Guys, mods, do your job. Get him out of here. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. He just said he's a coward. He won't call. Get him out of here. All right, brother. Let's talk about the questions. You ready? Guys, right, now yeah. let me just tell the mods. Mods. Please don't let the demons manifest because I want to answer this brother's questions. I promise you his question is going to benefit you Christians because it's questions such as, why did Jesus come to save the world and not the Father? I want to answer that one because that was the question, right? Yeah, that was his first question for you. He said he wants to speak on the um, Trinity with you in person. Or sorry. When? Like a one-on-one. -on -one. When? But whenever he's ready. Uh, okay. okay. Well, let me ask him. The Let first me... question for you was the um, Jesus, the only yes. question I would have about that is why didn't the Father Himself come down yes. and offer Himself as a sacrifice since He's all powerful? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, what does all powerful have to got, got to do with who died on the cross? What does that got to do with all powerful? How does one fall yeah. into the other? Um. I don't know. I, I guess he's asking why the father himself. Yeah. Now, I know the answer. Not, uh, I know the, yeah. his question, but what does one have to do with the other? Whether the father dies on the cross or the son dies on the cross, what does that have to do with being all-powerful? How does one fo follow from the other? How does one flow into the other? So you need to ask him that question because it makes no yeah. sense. Because it makes no mm -hmm. sense. Now, guys, do me a favor. Before I end the session, I have articles on the age of marriage according to the Bible. I have two articles on that. And I have an article on this very question. I wrote this in response to Shibrali, that other charlatan. Why is it the son came to die, not the father? Okay? So do me a favor, you two. Make sure I give you the links to the articles before I end the session. Can someone? Not when I said, okay, guys, God bless you, and I shut down. And then they said, oh, they are. Can you remind me to give you the links to the articles before I shut down? Because I have written an article on this. 
Why the son, not the father? Why did the son come to die, not the father? And also, I have two articles on the age of marriage according to the scripture. So I want you to save those articles, study them, use them in your Bible study, and pass them on for the glory of Jesus as the Holy Spirit enables us to understand what the Bible says so we can praise and magnify the name of Jesus. Now, brother, I need you to do me a favor. I need you yeah. to have your Bible open. Do you have it open? Uh, let me get, get your Bible, and I'm going to get some water because it's getting hit hot here, baby. It's getting hot. Oh, damn. Come on, Aki. What you doing, Aki? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Whoa, Aki. Yeah, Aki, you're going to win. Aki, man. Question. Let me repeat the question for their benefit. Question. Why did the son come down to die for us and not the father? Well, the Bible has an answer. Are you guys ready for the answer? The Bible, believe it or not, the Bible has an answer. You guys ready for the answer? Keep praying for me. God constrains me not to shame the name of Jesus to be bold for his glory. All right. Now, brother, let me walk you through this. Let's go to Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. One second. It's all right. I'll give you two seconds. Hebrews 1 and 3. I got it. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Yeah. All right. Read it for me. In the past, God spoke out uh, to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he points at heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited. It's superior to theirs. Okay, pause there. That was verse 3. Now, guys, I just gave you the link to this article in the comment section. I sent it three times. Click on and save it. Why did the son die? Now, I'm going to send it to you in the comment section. Now, read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, one more time. Hebrews 1, verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Okay, who is the heir of creation? The creation was created for whom and belongs to whom? By the Son. So the, the creation is the inheritance of the Son and belongs to the Son, right? Yeah. Okay, now go to Colossians 1, 15 and 16. And I want you to, when you get to Colossians 1... Before you read 15 and 16, I want you to start at verse 13. Read 13 to 16. Colossians 1, 13 to 16. Sorry. I'm fine. Don't worry. Take your time. Don't rush. Don't be nervous, my man. It's, I'm your friend, not your foe. So imagine. If I scare you, what I do to right. Muslims. Go! Oh! All right, good. Colossians 1, 13 to 16. Okay, um, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Okay, now he In does what for the son? Before you move on, he does what for the son? He loves the son, right? Yeah. He loves the son. Guys, God has transferred you from the power of Satan, the dominion of darkness, and brought you into the kingdom of his son whom he loves, the son of his love. So notice who Jesus is, the son of his love. Guys, focus, no side talk, no side tangent. I want you to learn and invite more people to learn this meat. Jesus is the son of God's love, his heart. Now keep reading. In whom we have redemption through the forgiveness of sins. Why are you stopping? Keep reading. Yeah, I didn't okay. know. Uh, the son is the... Before the rapture, brother, before I leave you behind. 
uh, for for him, all things were created, things in heaven on the Start at and six, on the 15 earth. again, because we didn't hear you. Start again, 15. You're getting nervous, brother. So start at 15. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Mm -hmm. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now notice the last sentence, a part of the sentence. Don't go to 17, brother. Just be, follow yeah. with me slowly. Don't get nervous and don't go ahead of me. I want you to follow with me because you need to learn this so you can then share it with him. If you're not learning it, you won't be effective. Guys, did you see what Colossians 1.16 said, especially the last part? All things were created through the Son for the Son. The Son is the Father's firstborn, his very heart, whom he loves. So when the Father created everything through the Son by the Spirit, what you just read was the Father and the Spirit created everything for the Son. The heavens and the earth and everything in them exist for the Son. So creation exists mm -hmm. for who? For the Son. Okay, so keep that in mind. He's the heir of all creation. Okay. All creation is his inheritance. It was created mm -hmm. for him. Now, go to Mark 12, verse 6. Mark 12, verse 6. Mark 12, verse 6, where our Lord speaks in a parable and identifies who he is. Who is he? Mark 12, 6, and then 7 with it. But start at 6. Mark 12, verse 6, all and right. then verse 7. Go ahead. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Okay, did you catch what they said? He is the yeah. son of the owner, the heir of the owner, the beloved of the owner. So because the owner loves the son so much, he's given everything to the son as an expression of his love. You are my son, my love, and here all this is yours as an expression of my love. You see it? Yeah. Okay, now John 16, 15. John 16, verse 15. Now, guys, if you're listening and don't allow the demons to distract you, you're going to learn why the son came and not the father. Okay. According to scripture, whether you like the answer or not, tough luck. I'm just going to give you guys the answer. Watch here. Now, John 16, verse 15. Okay. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. And this is for everyone, not just the brother, everyone. If all things belong to Jesus and Jesus is the heir of all creation, because Jesus is the son whom the father loves and adores. And out of his love for his son, he created everything through the son, by the spirit, for the son, as his gift to the son. Here, my son, this creation, we created for you as an expression of our love for you. Okay, now, if that's the case, then why does it shock any one of you that the heir of creation is the one who comes and redeems the very creation that was made for him as an expression of his father's love for him. Why would that shock you? Shut up. Let it sink in. I'm giving you guys a minute for it to sink uh -huh. in. Okay? So let it sink in. Why would it surprise us that the one for whom all creation exists, the one for whom all creation was made, as an expression of the Father's and Spirit's love for the Son. Son, this is all yours. This is made for you in your glory. Out of our love for you, we give it to you. Then why would it shock you that the Son then comes and redeems his very inheritance, the inheritance that he loves and cherishes, because that inheritance is the gift of his Father and his Spirit in their love for him. Is that making sense now? Yeah. So anyway, even if the father came, someone would say, why not the son? Or why not the spirit? In other words, it's not a question that's being asked sincerely. It's a question just to show supposedly the Trinity is irrational. But actually, it implodes in their face. Why? Because we see how rational, how consist consistent it is, and why it makes sense in light of the scriptures, the Bible. 
Not always, Angie. You don't have to, not everyone has to die. So let's be careful on that one. You don't have to die to have an inheritance because you have an inheritance from Christ. You don't have to die to receive it. He died for you. But anyway, let's not go too beyond the scripture and read too much into it. He died to redeem his inheritance from its corruption and bondage to evil. Right? So everyone clear? That's how you answer that question. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Now I can add further to it to show that who is the husband of the bride, the church? Is it the father or is it the son? Who is the it's husband the son, of right? the, yeah, Ephesians 5, yeah. 25 to 33. Yeah. So again, if Jesus is the husband and the church is his bride, why then would it shock you that the husband comes to redeem his bride? It's his bride. It's his responsibility to make sure he doesn't lose his bride and she doesn't get defiled. That's Ephesians 5, 25 to 33. So where's the problem? Anyone with a problem here? That's Ephesians 5, 25 to 33. In fact, let's look at Ephesians 5, 25 to 29. Let's read it. Ephesians 5, 25 to 29. If you can turn there, brother. Ephesians 5, 25 Ephesians to 29. 5, 25. 29, yes. Twenty nine to thirty five, no, you said? No, brother. I'm gonna hang myself Sorry. because you're not hold on. Let me get my shoestring. So not twenty five to twenty nine. But I'm gonna hang myself, brother, because you're not listening. Twenty five right. to twenty nine. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. He's going to present his own bride to himself, radiant without blemish. How? By cleansing her, by the washing of the water of the word. But that cleansing could only be effectual, efficacious, by him shedding his blood to redeem his church. So this is the husband's love for his bride. My bride is contaminated. My bride is polluted. But I love my bride too much to divorce her and get rid of her. So I won't get rid of her. I will wash her and purify her, making her radiant and bringing her to myself. Keep reading. Yeah. Keep reading. Go ahead. All the way to 29. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. That they feed and care for the body just as Christ does the church. You catch it? Christ treats you as his own body. And because you're his bride, he loves you. He cherishes you. He nourishes you. Though you've been polluted and tainted and corrupted, he doesn't give up on you and divorce you. Instead, he comes and washes you of your filth, of your pollution, to make you radiant and glorious again because he won't give up on you. And that's the example for husbands to emulate and their treatment of their spouses. That's what Paul is saying. Now, when you finish 29, read 30 to 32. 30 to 32, when you're done with 29. All right. Uh, for we for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Now, let me unpack what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that when you read about Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.24, where Adam and Eve yeah. come together, become one flesh, it's not really about Adam and Eve. It's really about Jesus Christ and the church. Adam and Eve were designed by God to be a physical sum symbol of a greater union, Christ, the last Adam, and the church, the last Eve, the second Eve. Do you understand what Paul just did, Christians? I want you to pay attention, Christians. Paul is saying... That Adam and Eve are physical symbols of a greater relationship, a greater union, a greater reality. Christ, the last Adam, and his bride, the church, which is Eve, coming together, becoming one. That's what he says. But then notice the exhortation to wives, because all throughout that was an exhortation to husbands. Husbands, treat wives like Christ treats the church. Now read verse 33 for me, brother. Read verse 33. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, 
and the wife must respect her husband. Now, here it says respect. It also means to revere your husband. You see, earlier, this yeah. confirms my previous session. If you're listening to the previous session today, what did I say is the satanic agenda? To destroy the structure that God has placed in the family and in the church to masculinize women, feminize men, so that there will be great destruction, great chaos and disunity, because when you destroy the structure that God has ordained for family and church, you destroy children, you destroy them psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and those children grow up to become the misfits that run society and plunge society into hell. Because notice what Ephesians 5.33 states. It says, husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church, and wives, revere your husbands. Side note, this is going to shock some of you. We're going to come back to the point. Do you know that you will not find in the letters, in the letters where Christians are exhorted to live the way God wants them to live, socially, politically, economically, religiously, maritally, you won't find an exhortation where women are said, wives, love your husbands. You know what wives are told to do? Wives, submit to your husbands, revere your husbands. It's the husbands who are, comp uh, who are repeatedly told, love your wives. Love your wives. Wives, submit and revere your husbands. And you know the number one problem in marriages today? Don't take my word for it. Studies has been done. Husbands complain their wives don't respect them. They don't honor them. And wives complain husbands don't love them. The exact thing the Bible exhorts husbands to do, love your wives and wives to do, respect your husbands. Okay? Sure. Everyone getting it? Yeah. Okay, now, how does that answer the question again? How does that answer the question? Coming back to the issue. If Christ is the husband of the bride... Why do you expect the father-in-law to come and rescue the bride as opposed to the husband? So Jesus is the heir and the husband. So it shouldn't shock us that the heir for whom creation belongs, the owner of creation, and the husband of the bride comes to save and redeem his bride, his creation. All of this is in my article that I gave you the link to. So that's the answer to that question. Now, did he have something about Jeremiah 8? I can yeah. Hear. Who's that Jeremiah in the back? Is that your dog crying? Are you neglecting starts. your dog? Sorry? I hear your dog, someone in the background crying. Is that your noise or is that? No, it's not my dog's neighbors. Okay, so hey, see? Someone's neglecting to love their female dog. You get it? There it goes. All right. Yeah. There's the link. I just posted again. Now, he had a question about Jeremiah 8.8. 8. Somebody just said it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just pulling it up right now. Jeremiah 8.8. He was about the lying scribes. But mind you, he doesn't like to read context, right? Of course. I mean, they like to cherry pick and just stop from here. But, yeah, I guess uh, Jeremiah 8.8. 8, uh, how can you say we are wise? For we have the law of the Lord. When actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. Yeah. And so he thinks that Jeremiah 8.8 8 teaches that the Bible's corrupt, right? It's like a self-admittance. Yeah, it's like okay. a self-admittance. Uh, yeah. I can tell much. you your friend has been listening too much to Shabir Ali and his pathetic arguments. Because these are typically yeah. arguments from Shabir Ali that I've addressed over the years. Because I know Shabir Ali. Now, guys understand what the Muhammad is trying to do. We did a session, David Wood and I had done a session on Jeremiah 8, and I have articles on this. So I'm going to give you the articles before I end. See, guys, okay. even your Bible says the Torah is corrupt. Notice what Jeremiah 8, 8 said. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. How can you say we are wise and the law of Jehovah the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. See, Jeremiah is saying there were scribes that corrupted the law, the Torah. You don't have it. Are you guys ready for the answer? Even if a Muslim didn't ask you this question, still, for you as a Christian, reads the Bible and sees this passage, you want to know what the answer is? You guys ready for the answer? Yeah. Because when I say, are you ready, I mean, you're going to focus and, then let not, and not allow Satan to distract you. Not allow Satan to distract you. Okay. Number one, even if we're going to take 
the worst case scenario, even if it meant, even if it meant that the law was being corrupted by these scribes. Number one, here's where I need you to listen, every one of you, right? Okay. That doesn't mean, dude, you got noise in the background like it's. it's oh, I'm sorry. What is going on in your house, man? Do you need an exorcism? <laughs> no, I'm in the backyard. Sorry. It's a garbage truck. My goodness, bro. It's okay. It's your world, buddy. We're squirrels. We're just going to wait yeah. for you to, you know, you know, it's your world. We're just going to sit here. Okay. Is it better? Yeah, no, no, it's better. Yeah. I mean, if you want, why don't you okay. just go in the middle of the traffic or in the highway so we can hear the cars coming by? Definitely not. No. <laughs> Yaki! Darn. Okay, anyway. Okay, let's, let's pay attention now. All right. Even in the worst case scenario, even in the worst case scenario, let's assume. This is saying that some scribes corrupted their copies of the Torah. Let's just go with that interpretation. Number one, that does not mean that these scribes had access to every copy of the Torah and corrupted every copy of the Torah so that the Torah was corrupted beyond restoration. Guys, pay attention to my argument. Even if it's referring to the Torah, it would only refer to the copies that those scribes had, but it doesn't mean all copies of the Torah that were in the possession of everyone so that they had access to all those copies to corrupt them beyond restoration. How do I know that? Because when Jeremiah is prophesying, folks, Jeremiah is prophesying, you have Daniel in Babylon who's aware of Jeremiah's writing, and he mentions the writing of Moses, the law. Go to Daniel 9, Daniel chapter 9. Let's read verses 1 to 3. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3. Pay attention, Daniel, who's a contemporary... Contemporary of, of <clears throat> Jeremiah. Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they're contemporaries. Daniel's in the palace of the king in Babylon, Iraq. Jeremiah is prophesying in, in Jerusalem. During the time, the king of Babylon is attacking and laying siege to Jerusalem. Daniel has a copy of the writing of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah finished writing his revelation, a copy was sent to Daniel. Pay attention. You guys got to listen and pay attention. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3. Brother, go ahead, read. All right. Uh, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made a rule, who was made a ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Now read verse 2 again. What did Daniel have? He had a copy of what? Daniel 9 verse 2, read 2 again. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem will last 70 years. Okay, let me ask you a question, brother, and everyone else. Yeah. Daniel is reading... The book of Jeremiah, where God told Jeremiah the captivity of the Jews in Babylon will last 70 years. That's the same Jeremiah you read that mentioned the law of the Lord, that the lying scribes, the pens of the scribes have falsified it. So Daniel is reading what Jeremiah wrote. But then in that same chapter, Daniel 9, verse 11, and then verse 13. Daniel 9, verse 11, and verse 13. Okay. Guys, pay attention. All that Israel, same chapter. Go ahead, read. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written into law of written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. What written where? You have written where? Written in the law of Moses. How does he know what's written in the law of Moses if he didn't have a copy of the law of Moses in his possession? Have been poured out. How do you know what's written in the law of Moses if Daniel did not have a copy of the law of Moses and what it wrote? What's the answer, dude? Don't go blank on me. I'm reading again. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. I'm not sure. Okay, read Sorry. it again, dude. You're, you ain't going nowhere until you get it. It's in front of your eyes. It's smacking you in the face. Read it again, verse 11. 
all Israel has, tran- has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curse and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us. Let me ask you the question again. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. How does he know what was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, about God's judgments upon them? What's the answer? How does he know what's written in it? How do you know what's written in your science textbook? The author. Okay. How do you know what's written in your science textbook? This is the problem with the with the 21st century, dude. The dumbing down of people is unbelievable. Because you got to have your science textbook in front of you to know what's written in it. Okay. How do you know what's written in the law of Moses? How do you know it's written in the law of Moses, brother? Please, brother, don't hurt me. Don't kill me. They were written down, right? Yeah, so how do you know it's written down? What's the answer? How does he know it's written down it's, there? Because of what? It's coming out. Come on. You have it? The, who has it? <laughs> well, go ahead. Who has it? Who's saying this? Who has it? Who knows what's written in it? Come on. You're getting it, brother. Come on. Restore my hope in humanity. Who's got it? Who said? Who's saying these words? Whose words are you reading? Moses. No. Whose words are you reading? Let's try it again. Hold on. Let me talk to the wall here. Hey, Tony. God's word. Okay, one more time, brother. Are you reading Aunt Jemima? Are you reading Daniel? Daniel. Okay, let's try it again. Who's writing this, Daniel or my grandmother? Daniel. Okay. So who is aware of what was written in the law of Moses? Daniel. So how does he know what's written in the law of Moses? What does it mean? I don't get it. I mean, I guess they, they okay. have the laws, right? Yeah, yeah. Why, why are you scared? Say it. The only way he can know what's in something is if he has it, mister. Yeah. Okay. If, if, if I say, hey, man. What's written in your science science textbook? That means I assume you got your science textbook to know what's written in it. Yeah. Okay, so when he says, all the curses written in the law of Moses have come upon us, what does that mean? How does he know if he doesn't have the law of Moses? I understand. So what does it mean? Explain it to me because I'm your Muslim friend. Explain it to me. I'm your Muslim friend. Your Torah is corrupt, man. And what's the what are you going to answer? What are you going to say? That they have the laws. How do we know he has the law? Because Daniel is prophesying about something that happened before about the curses. Okay, and how does Daniel know what's in? Yeah, how does Daniel know what's in those curses? Where is he getting it from? Where is he getting it from? Come on now, come on. I mean, essentially, he's getting it from God, but. The law is written down for, by Moses, right? Yeah, and how does he know what's written in the law of Moses? Because of what? Come on, man. Don't hurt me, bro. I'm going to retire from know. apologetics. I swear <laughs> I'm going to go and start delivering pizza if you don't get this. How does he know what's written in the law of Moses? Because the because the uh, curses have been poured out against them. How does he know that Moses wrote about curses, bro? I hope we're not going to be here till midnight, man, because I'm going to have to end the session then. Because it's, if you can't get this point, you're not going to be able to up your friend. How does he know that Moses wrote about curses that would fall upon the nation if they didn't obey God? I don't know. Read verse 13 for me, brother. Let's try. Verse 13. Daniel 9, 13. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, how does he this know, disaster has How does he us. know, brother, just as it is written in the law of Moses, how does he know what is written in the law of Moses? How does he know? Because they have to have it. Okay. He has to have the curse. You got it. Who has to have it? That's what I, yeah. Who Daniel. Has, yeah, baby. Yeah, but that means the law of Moses could not be corrupted because he had a copy in his possession that wasn't corrupted. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Bam, baby! Now you'll never forget because of the pressure I put on you. I made you shake in your boots. You're sweaty now. Even your shoes are, are wet from the sweat, baby. Now you yeah, got the answer. Just a little bit. Right? All right. Now yeah. you tell your friend, wait, buddy. Daniel in Iraq. Daniel in Iraq has got a copy of Moses, a pure, uncorrupt copy of Moses. How did those scribes corrupt that? They couldn't. So why are you misquoting Jeremiah 8.8, 8, loser? Well, no, you don't call him a loser, by the way. I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you got the answer now, right? I got you. So here's yeah. an uncorrupt copy of Moses in the possession of Daniel in Iraq, Babylon, that those scribes that Jeremiah is talking about did not have access to. I love you, man. Okay, now you're ready for more. Just bear with me. Don't worry. Let the take the pressure, brother. This is boot camp. I got it. This is boot camp, sir. Now let's go. Yeah. Nehemiah chapter eight. Nehemiah chapter eight. I'm gonna walk you through this. I promise you. After this, you'll never forget All it. Right. You're gonna have nightmares about this session. No, Sam. No. <laughs> All right. All right. Nehemiah chapter eight. Yeah. Let's read verses right. one to four to start with. Nehemiah eight verses one to four. Man, uh, praise God. Now, by the way, before you read, the reason why I don't just give it to you, because when I yeah. ask you, it's going to force you to think and meditate so it can become second nature. You see why I'm doing this? Yeah, I appreciate it. I don't want to simply give it. I want you to struggle and sweat spiritually because once you do, you'll remember it and it's going to sink in and now you can share it for the glory of Christ. So now in MI8 verses 1 to 4. All right. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. Wait, how could they bring out a book they didn't have? Bring out the book of the law of Moses. Mm. Right? And by the way, this is after the captivity, after they return from Babylon, after they go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, after Jeremiah's dead, after those scribes dead, And they still had the book of the law of Moses. Read verse 2 again. Uh, Verse 2. Yeah. So on the the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men women and others who could understand and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law the book of the law wow all the way to four when you finish yeah. four, let me know the book of the law so they're hearing it they see the copy yeah. of it he's got the copy in his hand they see them reading from it and hearing it and they're going to explain it now when you're done with verse four read five to nine then read from verses five okay. to nine ezra the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion Beside him on his right stood uh, Matita, Shema, Enea, Uriah, Elkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were uh, Pedeia, Michelle, Malkija, Hashem, Hashabanana. You want Zechariah, a banana? And Michelle. I like oranges, bro. No bananas for me. Hush, yeah. <laughs> but I keep reading. Hashabanana. Yeah, hush, uh, the, hush yeah. that banana, buddy. Ezra opened, the, Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jemin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodea, Messiah, Kalitza, and Peleah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law, of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Oh, let me read. Let me read that verse for you one more time. Verse eight. So they read verse eight distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense Mm -hmm. and helped them understand the, the reading. How in the world could they read the book of the law of God clearly, slowly and interpret it if the book of the law had been corrupted during the time of Jeremiah? Now read verse nine. Read verse nine. The name it. Then uh, Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. 
they listened the to the words of yeah. the law that no longer existed because it had been corrupted in the time of Jeremiah, right? Mm -hmm. You see how silly that argument is? Mm -hmm. Now, read verses 12 to 14. 14. Yeah. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, uh, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. Wow. Now, final one, verse 18. And we're going to okay. sum this up so everyone understands what's happening. Verse okay. 18. 18. Yes. Day after day, from the first from the first day to the last, Ezra read, the, Ed, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Okay, now, here's my question for your friend. How in the world mm -hmm. does Ezra... <clears throat> After the death of Jeremiah, those scribes that Jeremiah mentioned, after the Jews returned from Babylon, have an actual copy of the book of the law of Moses, read from an actual copy of the book of the law of Moses, interpret what's in the law of Moses, and the people hearing the words from the book that God gave to Moses containing his law, how could that be if your friend's interpretation of Jeremiah 8.8 8 is sound? And how could Daniel in Iraq, Babylon, a contemporary of Jeremiah who read Jeremiah's book, because it says in Daniel 9-2, he had the scroll of the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah and was reading Jeremiah's scroll. How could he have a book, the copy of the law of Moses, and know what's written in it if the law of Moses was corrupted? In other words, this is silly and pathetic because Jeremiah 8-8 is not saying that the Torah, the law of Moses, was corrupted beyond restoration. They no longer had accurate copies of what Moses originally wrote by inspiration of God. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Daniel had an actual copy, an accurate copy. Ezra did. Others did. Even Jesus himself, because at the time of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17, 18, Matthew 5, 17, 18, Jesus says, Do not think I've come to destroy the law of and the prophets. I did not come to the story, but to fulfill. How are you fulfilling a law, Jesus, that doesn't exist? But let's put that aside. Let's put that aside. Mm -hmm. Let's now focus on what the Quran says. Write these down for future reference. Okay. Write these down yeah. for future reference. Okay, now, Paul Subakhr. Paul Subakhr, are you there? Paul, respond immediately, Paul. Paul Subhakar. Immediately. I don't want you here anymore. I want you to get out of here. Padawan, I want to throw you out of here too. Because for the last 10 minutes, you and him have been debating whether the father can be seen and ignoring and disrespecting me and the people and the topic that I'm addressing. I think both of you need to go. Get them both out of here. Block them, please. Mods, quickly. All right? Okay, now. For you, brother, to pay attention, Yeah. write down chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 48 and 50. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 48 and 50. Write these down. All right? Chapter 3, verse 48. And then 50. So chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 48 okay. and verse 50. Write it down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then write down chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 46. Chapter 5, verse 46. All right? Okay. And then write down chapter 61, verse 6. 61, verse 6. Okay, now here's why. In all three mm -hmm. passages, it says that Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands and that God taught him the Torah. So you ask your friend, how did Jesus confirm the Torah between his hands if the Torah was corrupted at the time of Jeremiah? Are you saying that your God, Allah, was stupid? or deceptive in that he deceived Jesus to confirm the Torah that he had in his hand when that Torah isn't genuine, isn't real, it's corrupt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his point doesn't really make sense. I mean, he says the NGO, I mean, pretty much everything is 
laws besides the okay. Quran, right? But even That's if, like, it, okay, it. let's say we'll go there. So what, what, mm -hmm. what Torah was Jesus confirming? The Quran says, Allah taught him the Torah. He confirmed the Torah between his hands, the Torah that they're reading at that time. But according to him, Jeremiah 8.8 8 says the Torah was corrupt at the time of Jeremiah, over 500 years before the time of Christ. So that means Allah is either a liar and a deceiver, or he's stupid and ignorant because he had Jesus confirm a Torah that was not the actual Torah of Moses, but a corrupt, <clears throat> unreliable copy. Mm. See the problem? Yeah. Final problem, write down Jeremiah 36, the entire chapter of Jeremiah 36. Okay? Now, this is going to establish a point. In Jeremiah 36, and I want everyone to listen because we're going to wrap it up with one, one or two more questions. And I'll answer more of your questions in the upcoming week, brother. But I just want you to All focus right. on these two, this because I don't want to give you too much. Re-listen to this and send it to him if he's really sincere. In Jeremiah 36, in Jeremiah 36, chapter 36, God tells Jeremiah, write down in a scroll the words and send it to the king. So then Jeremiah calls his scribe, Berechiah, Baruch. And he says, write, these are the words of the Lord. When they sent the copy to the king, every time it was read, the king would take his knife and cut a piece of the scroll and throw it in the fire and destroy it. So he destroyed that copy that contained the words of God. In Jeremiah 36, God tells Jeremiah, take up another scroll, write down all the words in the first scroll and these additional words. Okay, so what did you learn right there, folks? God is able to inspire a prophet to restore a revelation that's been destroyed word for word. Because that's what God did for Jeremiah in Jeremiah 36. He wrote a scroll. The king destroyed it and burned it. God then told Jeremiah, yeah. take up another scroll, write down all the words in the first scroll and these additional words. So wait, you're telling me. God is able to restore the scroll of Jeremiah's prophecies because Jeremiah is a prophet receiving revelation, but he was incapable of restoring all the original words given to Moses at the hands of a prophet like Jeremiah. That's what you want me to believe? You see how pathetically bad this argument is? You guys see how pathetically bad this argument is? So what does Jeremiah 8 verse 8 mean? Now that I've given you conclusive proof, and I'm going to give you proof from... Jeremiah himself, Jeremiah 26, verses 4 and 5. Jeremiah 26, verses 4 and 5. Did Jeremiah think there was no longer an accurate copy of the law? Of course not. Jeremiah 26, verses 4 and 5. Watch what he says there. Jeremiah 26, verses 4 and 5. Yeah. And now I'm going to give you the links, and we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to give you the links, and we're going to wrap it up. But read Jeremiah 26, okay. verses 4 and 5. Uh, say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servant, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened. Okay, now here's my question for you. How could God mm -hmm. say, if you don't walk in my law, which I've set before you, if the law was corrupted? Did you see what God said in verse 4? If you don't walk in my law that I set before you, what law, God? The scribes corrupted it. What are you talking about? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, right? So now Jeremiah believes the law is still there and God expects them to obey it. Daniel has a copy of the law of Moses. It's not corrupt. Ezra had a copy of the law of Moses that wasn't corrupt. Jesus had access to copies of the law of Moses that were not corrupt. The Quran agrees Jesus confirmed the copies of the Torah in his possession as uncorrupt. And yet your friend wants to say, forget Muhammad, which I agree, forget Muhammad, flush him down the toilet. Forget what the Quran says. Forget what Jesus says in the New Testament. Forget what Daniel says. Forget what Ezra says. Forget what Jeremiah says elsewhere. And forget the fact that God has the power to have someone restore the words in a scroll that has been destroyed because he's almighty to do that. Let's forget all that and let's focus on Jeremiah 8.8 8 and misinterpret it to teach something it wasn't meant to teach. Isn't that amazing? And yeah. they wonder why we are disgusted with Islamic apologetics 
and why we can't stand Muhammad, this filth of the devil. May the Lord Jesus give us power to destroy his legacy, his his lies, and his book. Now, what does Jeremiah 8.8 8 mean? Whatever it means, Jeremiah 8 verse 8, it cannot mean that the copies of the Torah that contain the words that God gave through Moses were all corrupted beyond restoration. It can't mean that just from the evidence I gave you. So what does it mean? Mm -hmm. It means that the scribes were misleading people by their exposition, not corrupting the text of, the, of, of, of Moses, but by writing an exposition that misinterpreted the true meaning of the law of Moses. Okay. You get my point? Yeah. You, you understand? I mean, making sense now, right? That's what it means. Now, yeah. you turn it against him. In chapter 15, verses 90 to 91 of the Quran, it says, Woe to those who have shredded the Quran. Woe to those who have torn the Quran into shreds who've dismembered the Quran, chapter 15, verses 90, 91. So tell your friend, hey, friend, I got one even better than the one you have. In chapter 15, verses 90, 91, it says there were people at the time of Muhammad that dismembered the Quran, that tore the Quran into shreds, that destroyed the Quran, proving the Quran is corrupt, flush it down the toilet. Why are you still a Muslim? Yeah. I mean, he says he just needs 1%, but I believe I've shown him enough. To be no, he's, no, listen, you yeah. can give him 50%. Unless Holy Spirit can yeah. fix him, it's not going to work. But now, exactly. let yeah. me give you let me give you the article. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here goes. Guys, here are the articles. I'm going to give you at least two. Okay, two of them. All right, here you go. Here's one and a response to a Muslim, all right? Here's one article. Here it goes. I'm going to, I'm going to post it twice. Here it is. Jeremiah 80. What does it mean? What it doesn't mean? That's one. I'm going to send it to you now in the comment section of uh, Skype. Okay. Here you go. Don't go anywhere, over, my friend. Okay. Did you get that link? I just sent that to you. Did you get it? Yeah. Okay, now here's the second one. And I got one on marriage, so don't go anywhere, folks. Here's my response, response to Bazam Zawadi. Here's the second link on Jeremiah 88. I'm going to post it twice again. Click on it, save the material, print it out, distribute it, teach it to others, Bible study, Sunday school. You got my permission. Let's spread this for the glory of Jesus. Let's invite more people who are sincere and want to learn. So we get up to 400, 500 quality people to learn from these sessions, to be on fire, sold out for Jesus, filled with the Spirit. So you got that one too? Yes, sir. Okay, now, the ones on marriage. So let me get you the ones on marriage. Hold on. Here you go. Here's one. Again, I'm gonna. There's two of them, but I'm gonna give give you the first one. Here it is. Here's the one on marriage. What does the Bible say about the age of marriage? I just posted it twice in the section. Save it, folks. And here's it for you. Here it is for you. And then another one. And this is it. We're done for today. God willing, I'll be back. God willing, Lord Jesus willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. God willing, if the Lord is pleased, pray for my health and holiness and purity to keep losing weight to be healthier holier on fire for jesus pray that we're all on fire for jesus pray my daughters will be healthy and in love with jesus and provide for us bring more people to learn and bring my daughters to me in jesus name here it is the other one Amen. we're done i'll be on tomorrow god willing god willing tomorrow at 5 p.m eastern standard time 5 p.m eastern standard time but don't go anywhere let me get you the final article is god amazing or what here it is Look at all yes. these responses, all these articles, all these rebuttals, all this material that God has provided through his servants, raising up people, unprofitable people like me by the power of the Holy Spirit, to write all this for your benefit, to do these sessions for your benefit. All you need to do is study the material, meditate on it, share it, teach it. Employ it until it becomes second nature. Disseminate this information for the glory of God. And remember, Christ is risen, risen indeed. And we love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with the Spirit. Save us from our flesh, from sin. Help us to be holy unto the Lord, to delight your heart. Save us from Satan and the world. Provide for us and our loved ones, for my children. In Jesus' name, 
Modern author, Lord comes sooner than later. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Guys, God bless you. I'll see Amen. you tomorrow. Lord is risen and Thank loves you, us. Son. God bless you, brother. I'll talk to you more. Thank Take care. All right. Bye -bye.